Okay, so we're just at time to start this session. So welcome everyone who has joined today's session, which is on an introduction to ML.net. So today's session, which is being run by the Microsoft Reactor London, um, will be delivered by David Griswood and Phil Harvey, who are both Cloud Solution Architects in Microsoft. And during today's session, you're welcome to join in on the Q&A, leave any feedback or comments in there. All the questions will be answered um, throughout the session and definitely by the end of the session today by our speakers. Um, for your information, this session is being recorded. Um, so the session will be put onto our YouTube Microsoft Reactor channel um, within within a couple of days. So I'll make sure to post that on Meetup once it's live. Um, so without further ado, David, I will hand over to you to begin today's session. Good morning, good morning. My name's David Gristwood and I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Phil Harvey. Say hello, Phil. Hello, everybody. Hi there. Right, so we're both very excited at this opportunity to talk about ML.net. It's a relatively new uh, product offering. Uh, I think it's one that perhaps hasn't got the awareness it deserves. Phil and I have spent some time playing around with it, learning how it works, and we think it tackles a very interesting market of people who've built up .NET, say C-sharp or F-sharp skills, wanting to enter the world of machine learning and we are today Phil aren't we we're talking about machine learning as in building our own models not making calls like with cognitive services into other folks model it's about taking data that you have building models that allow you to make predictions and do all sorts of interesting algorithmic stuff and we feel that for people with those skills wanting to tackle those project areas this is a really interesting product and so that's what we want to spend our time uh, focused on Really simple agenda here. Very briefly, just give a little bit of positioning on what ML.net is and isn't, so you get a sense of uh, what the focus is going to be for today. Um, because the sample we're using later on, ROMCOM or not ROMCOM, which we're sort of building as the core part of this presentation, deals with language processing, language here. Phil is going to use this session as an opportunity to talk about AI in the world of language and try to cover some of the basics that provide some context to what we did and how interesting and challenging working with languages and where we are um, currently uh, in the evolution of that processing. And then in terms of coding, we'll start to look at the core things about ML.NET that you really need to understand to make sense of the example. We'll then take you through the salient points of ROMCOM or not ROMCOM and give you a chance to actually test it out yourself. And then we'll briefly touch on a couple of the more advanced features that we really don't have the scope in this session to cover in any depth, but it would be remiss of us to leave um, this session without mentioning AutoML and the Model Builder tool. So if I was in a room physically with you, I'd look around and perhaps say, so how does that sound? And hope a few of you would nod. Can't quite do that, but um, let's take it. This seems for most folk a reasonable agenda there. So let's start with what is ML.net. And this is the slide that really encompasses it here. So it is open source, which is very much the way Microsoft are doing a lot of their work today in developing in the open, taking feedback and doing that all in an open fashion. Because it's .NET Core, it's cross-platform across Windows, Linux and Mac OS. And I said earlier on, it's about machine learning. It's taking data and building models. Um, and we like to think that it's really sweet spot. The Venn diagram is really the center bit is people who learnt.net, are familiar with VS Code or Visual Studio, know how the framework works, have invested a lot of time and effort into understanding it and want to enter the world of machine learning, but feel that they shouldn't have to throw that all away and learn a brand new language such as Python or R and new tools and everything. Um, so I, th I think that's an important part of it. And it's also trying to make that runway into machine learning a lot easier. You don't need to be a data scientist 
to start building these models. And in fact, this is a great way of starting to increase your awareness because as you start building up skills, you probably want to explore a little bit more about the world of the algorithms that are taking place under the cover, which is why Phil is doing his session on language to show how um, the rom-com example really was a springboard to jump into the whole world of language processing. I, I don't think longer term in essay that ML.net will try to cover every single algorithm, every single area. I, you know, I don't know whether many data scientists have already built up skills elsewhere will come to ML.net. It's more the other way around. I think the goal is to do at least the 80-20 cover the common tasks that people want to do in machine learning using the .NET framework. So, you know, the screen here shows a lot of different examples. Classification is the one that we're going to be focusing on, whether a movie is a rom-com or not. But we do regression to do a numerical analysis and make predictions. We can forecast in to the future. We can look for anomalies in data. We can rank data. We can take a whole pile of data and see if there are any natural clusters underneath them or build recommendation engines. These are the sort of core scenarios and many of the projects people are trying to do with machine learning today tend to fall into that. And the nice thing about ML.net is there's lots of examples and a big community around there that gets you started. And then to the right hand side, by hooking in uh, with the vision frameworks and through Model Builder, we can do object detection and image classification. I will cover that in the Model Builder bit later on in the session. In order to really get your head around ML.net, uh, it's important to appreciate the stack here. And it's a, it's a relatively simple stack. At the bottom is the API, and that's what we're mostly going to be talking about. You know, this is the API that gets exposed to your code. This is the way you're going to interact with ML.net. And this is really our core focus for today. I think once you understand the API and get your head around it, then most of the other things just kind of naturally fit in there. There is an auto ML capability on there, and we'll come back and explore that because doing all the algorithmic choice and hyperparameter tuning is hard work. Um, and therefore, anything we can do to automate that just makes your life easier. You get at that auto ML through the ML.NET CLI. That's its core focus today. So we'll briefly look at that and how you'd actually set off an auto ML project. And then finally, the Visual Studio add-in model builder is a way of really sort of automating this process and making that transition into this world an awful lot easier by doing a wizard style approach and take you through one step at a time. The final bit of this positioning it is to try to step back for a second and take a holistic view of the whole cycle. And I, I love this slide because I think it tries to show the entire life cycle. There's the left hand side where we create the models and on the right hand side where we consume them. These two processes are not equally balanced. The left hand side is where all the hard work happens. The right hand side is relatively easy to do and they're glued together by the model file. Now, even to the world's worst kept secret, the model file, it's just a zip file. You can crack it open and have a look inside. Not a lot to see, but it's all tucked in there. So on the left hand side, you get into this process. This is the one that absorbs probably perhaps 80 percent of the time on a machine learning project where you take the data, you pull out the features that you want to focus on. You try to build models that you think will you give you the best results. You test them and typically you get it wrong first time. You go through this loop on the left hand side of playing with the data. It's known as data wrangling. You take the data, you wrestle it, beat it to the ground and apply the right algorithms till you've got a model that you're happy with. You export that as a zip file that now encompasses the entire stuff you need to know about the model in that one zip file. And on the right hand side, using your favorite um, .NET core framework tools, you actually can deploy this, whether it's client side, a desktop app behind a bot, whether you want to put it into container and then have it run in Kubernetes or behind an app or in Azure Functions. We don't mind. It's really flexible. And this 
whole process tends to iterate over time. As you get more data, the model is improved. We have this um, loop continually reinforcing and improving it. So that's my initial sort of trying to position it. This is where I hand over to Phil, who I believe wants to probably take control at this point of the desktop. Yes, uh, David, there we go. You have the call. Perfect. Thanks, David. That's a really useful introduction to where ML.NET sits. Now, if we look at where language sits, we start off with the very beginning. Oh, there we go. The very beginnings of artificial intelligence. And many might have heard of the Turing test. This is a test that is based in communication through natural language. So the, the test, and you could read more about it in, in your own time should you wish to, is about a person judging whether the text responses in natural language are coming from a machine or from a person. And if the machine can fool that tester, then it's considered to have artificial intelligence under the bounds of this test. So the processing of natural language is a key part right from the start of artificial intelligence. As you can imagine, this has expanded out over time, both from the academic side and from the industry side. On the academic side, you're thinking about that scientific understanding of language. So this includes uh, linguistics, information engineering, computer science, all under the bounds of artificial intelligence. And it's about studying human language with technology. On the industry side, we've seen the emergence of things like chatbots, which uh, in some senses are very much like the uh, Turing test itself. We've seen ideas of content generation, and within that, you find this thing called NLG, or natural language generation, which is under this overall mantle of natural language processing. You'll see analytics of language, and essentially what you're considering here is language as a source of data. Now we're talking about ML.NET, which isn't in the field of deep learning at the moment. It has some interoperability there. But the key thing here is that uh, many of the news articles you'll see will talk about these highly detailed examples. You'll hear words like BERT and transformers and all of these kind of uh, really clever and somewhat academic deep learning frameworks for processing language. There's a, a GitHub repository uh, linked to the bottom where you can see what uh, our teams consider to be the best that they can get running with consistent results at the moment. You'll see a set of tools, uh, a set of scenarios there from text classification that we'll talk to all the way through to sentiment analysis. Now, the reason we're talking about natural language in ML.NET is because you don't need to go all the way through to these deep learning capabilities at the start. There's loads of value to be got from the tools um, that you have before needing to go and run things within these repositories. Text summarization is an amazing piece of work that you'll see producing um, some quite incredible results. And you'll also hear things like the AI supercomputer on Azure and this thing called the Turing NLG model, which is 17 billion parameters um, that we're developing. That's not the focus of today, but I wanted to, to make sure you understood that while you're hearing about these things in the media, there's loads of tools that you can use right now without needing an AI supercomputer. So if we look at, first of all, the understanding of language, you might have met Lewis when you're thinking about developing chatbots. But what Lewis essentially is, is the ability to build in a browser a language model that divides down a piece of text, like I would like to order a pepperoni pizza, into this idea of an utterance or a sentence, we might call it, an intent, which is what the person is trying to do, and an entity. When you think about this set and there is complexity under the surface there that you can build out in this language model, you're looking to detect these things to understand what that language is about. It's often used in chatbots to help guide the conversation, but you can also use that in the analysis of language as well. If you look at the advanced end of the spectrum, there's this machine comprehension under the AI lab. So there's a piece of text on uh, step one, and then I ask a question. I asked, who was sad? And on the right hand side, it gives me the answer of Imelda Riviera, which is based on the particular story here. If we look at 
other examples, I've put in some Wikipedia text about a cat. And I've asked, does a cat have slow reflexes? And it's extracted an answer for me here from that text. And if we keep going, you know, we can ask questions like what was that initiated in ancient Egypt? And there is understanding of the text, the level that it can tell me that cat domestication from the text I've given uh, was initiated in ancient Egypt. I asked what my cat is called and it says Phyllis Catus, but more for you AI, I don't have a cat, I have a dog. So you'll see the context is very important here that uh, it doesn't know everything. It is just a form of language understanding algorithm processing that text through to an answer. I mentioned that core language generation and I wanted to share uh, some examples here so you can see that you don't need those very expensive large models to make that work. Oh, David, I'm having trouble advancing the slide here. Let's try that. There we go. So, for example, here is a piece of uh, poetry I generated based on that picture of a crow or a raven. I'm not sure which from this picture. Now, I didn't need deep learning for this. What I did is I used a model building tool. You can do this kind of thing in ML.NET as well. And I pushed in a whole bunch of classic literature and built what's known as a Markov model, which is a statistical model about which words follow which words. It's similar in nature to the way that some of the deep learning techniques work, but a lot simpler. This kind of runs on uh, my laptop, as it were. What I then did is I took that model, just as David described, and I made some code could be .NET, trigger this. But instead of triggering it myself, I used one of the cognitive services to generate the text that would trigger that model. I used sentiment to create some order, and then at the end, I outputted the poem that we saw before. Now, you the reason truly, I wanted to- You truly were inspired by that picture then. I, the, the poem that AI generated was inspired by the picture. And um, we can have another conversation, I think, on another call, maybe about the nature of creativity in that. Um, but what I'm showing here is this is uh, these techniques that David's talked about before, where ML.NET sits. You can use it on the full range of these NLP and NLG capabilities. And again, with the kind of deep learning example, you can go and look at Pixter Story, which is a Microsoft research version using deep learning, and see that it's created a th thriller about that photo of a car. Now, the question I have here is there, their piece of text um, is somewhat gruesome. Is it better or is it worse than my simple model? Some people would say better, it's slightly better uh, grammar, for example, but there are still some challenges in NLG, which is why we're investing so heavily in the kind of compute necessary to make it work. One of the most famous examples from OpenAI is this GPT-2 model. Again, I've put in an example piece of text from uh, the Wikipedia article on cats, and this generated the, the sentence highlighted in blue. It says that cats regenerate about two to three hours after its dormancy end of text, Salt Lake City, Utah. Again, it's the best model out there at the moment, but it still generates some kind of crazy things. So maybe generating a piece of text and tidying it up using simpler techniques might be useful. Now if we move across into this idea of analyzing language. And I think the reason I finish with this one in this final section is that this is where the most value comes out for business. The ability to understand uh, text as data as it fits into your analysis process. Because our goal, oops, looks like David has taken focus away from the presentation. There we go. Um, right, back again. Our goal is to democratize AI, to empower every person and every organization to achieve more. And the fuel of this transformation are the signals from data that we generate using these algorithms. And if we look at the range of models, at the top, we talk about these sophisticated pre-trained models. These popular frameworks, we're talking about .NET Core in this session and ML.NET on top of that, are a layer down. There are language tools that you can use when you don't necessarily build them yourselves within those cognitive services. And you can see text analytics sitting in the middle, which gives you a whole bunch of content already provided by Microsoft. So the popular frameworks, the tools we're talking about today, 
are the things you should use after you've tried these pre-built services. There's no point in reinventing the wheel here. Um, and, you know, using these services, I can analyze everything down to personally identifiable information entities under the named entity recognition, which is incredibly powerful when you're making sure that, for example, your GDPR compliant. You could use it against old data that's not going to change. So I use this to analyze uh, Macbeth, for example, and to see where the key plot points kick in. But when you're looking at your data, the really specific pieces for your business, these general models won't be the ones that you want to use. The reason for that is you'll have very specific things in your text that relate to your business. And that's where the power of these frameworks like ML.net come in. So here's a couple of examples of classifiers and we'll be moving on to, to the in-depth example that Dave will take you through shortly. At the top here, we have a binary classifier. So it shows the green tick, the text is about cats and a red cross to say the text is not about cats. You may notice a theme of cats because in artificial intelligence on the internet, you have to have cats in there somewhere. So what happens here, and David will go through the pipeline uh, for the bottom example shortly. So Bill, is this an example of supervised learning in terms of those ticks and crosses? Did someone have to go through the work and set that up for this? That's a that's a great question, David. Yes, that's the case. So you can see there in the, the big text file, it says tagged examples. What I built out was a set of text that I tagged myself uh, with modern tools, you can use emojis like ticks and crosses as well as your categorizations, which makes things a whole lot more fun. But I had to say what is about a cat and what is about a dog. So again, you can see my sum code there for the binary example I use in JavaScript. Just there are other language besides .NET available um, and Dave will take you through the ML.NET example. Got that model which David talked about, you know, did, did the work to tag up the examples and then I got to a classification. Now, this is very easy to iterate. It's very easy to get started with. The hard work comes in tagging those examples for that supervised learning. Now, there are tools like Azure Search, which can be used to start to group together data using search terms and those kind of things, which can accelerate you at that point. But you are going to need those tagged examples from somewhere. And at the bottom, you can see what's called a multi-class classifier. And this is the example we're going to go through today. The reason we want to focus in on here is that multi-class classification is extremely useful and easy to get started with in many areas of business. David and I like to use fun examples, but you can start to classify the transcripts of bot conversations. You can look at call center logs, you can look at the reports you put out, the marketing text you deliver all the way through to, to MarTech and advertising. By building multi-class classifiers, you get new data that allows you to look at the text you produce within your business in new ways. So hopefully that's given some context to the example about how natural language processing is right at the heart of artificial intelligence and machine learning right from the start and why it's a good thing to look at, especially when you're starting out on your journey, because you can get some early results very easily. So I'm going to hand back to David at this point, relinquish control of the screen. There we go. Cool. Thank you for that. Thank you back, David. Thank so you. Phil has um, given you a sense of a flavour of uh, I think particularly why language is really interesting on both the generation and the processing and it's uh, really the processing that we are going to address in our rom-com example. Uh, before we get to that, need to explain a little bit more about how ML.NET works in order to, to make sense of the code's example here. So if you remember the diagram earlier on where I said this is a nice thing, it shows the whole life cycle, the left hand side is bigger than the right hand side. This is the same diagram, but uh, turned upside down. So on the top left corner, you can see that data wrangling cycle that we go through. We output a model in the bottom, we make predictions. So that's the thing you need to um, hold in your mind as you go through this. And on the right hand side, this is the skeleton of what your code will look like, no matter how complex it gets with all the detail. When you boil it down, this is what 
essentially every ML.NET application that's working with the API looks like. There's these five core steps. We need an ML context that we use throughout the process, so we just craft one up. That's very easy. Step two is where we take the data in and bring it into memory for processing using an iData view. Um, I'll talk about in a second the different options here, but the common one I found over the last couple of years working with data scientists, everything is in comma separated value or tab separated value files, although we can extend beyond that. But a lot of the work with models assumes that there's a file sitting there with your data. And the first thing you're going to do is reach into that file and pull the data out bring it into memory, ready to process it, and there's different uh, options to um, let the system get a better understanding of what the data looks like. So has header is true, meaning the very first line has actually the header names, and then the, the second line onwards is the data. Once we have one of these data views, we need to actually do the machine learning, and this is where the real magic happens and we'll come back to seeing a, a real world example here but uh, and I'll explore this in a little bit more depth in, in a two slides time this is where we take the data and we apply the logic necessary to turn um, this into an actual machine learning model so we use this dot notation um, in .NET Core, where we keep adding these steps, where we featureize the text, where we append this, where we apply this algorithm, and so on. And it's, I'll be honest, it looks kind of scary the first time you see it because it's quite dense and quite compressed, but inside it represents all the logic necessary to do the transformation on that data that you've got. And then the magic really happens when we run the data through this transform process in step four using the fit method. So you can see on the right, we take the data that's in the data reader, we take this uh, estimator that we've built up and we call fit. And at the end of that, we actually have a model. And once we have the model, we're now flipping over to the, the bottom half of the diagram here. Our training work has been done. This is, this is the easy coasting now. We've done the heavy lifting, we've got a model, and now we simply want to use it to make predictions. So um, ML.NET has a prediction engine capability, so we create a prediction engine and we feed some stuff into it and see what comes out. So this is a sentiment analysis one, so the text we're putting in, this is a horrible movie, and what we'd expect to get out is a yay or nay, a zero or one, depending on the sentiment, and a probability. That's an important part of ML.NET. As with all the other machine learning things, you get a probability of how certain the algorithm thinks that that is a you know, good sentiment or bad sentiment. And based on that probability, you codify your solution as to whether you think yes or no. So let's look at two of those bits because it is quite complex and it's a lot to take in. I do appreciate in this one session. But when we load data up, we create one of these data views, which is at the heart of the way we handle data. And the key thing to note is on the left hand side, we have the data coming in from an external uh, source. We have in the middle the class that we'll build up to hold this. And the most important thing is that very first thing, the label, because on the right hand side, we have the different types of irises and the attributes that are specific to them, particularly measurements about the length and width and the petals and the like. And as humans, we can easily read it and say, ah, for the first type of virus, I've got some measurements here. For the second type of virus, I've got some more measurements. And you can see that with enough measurements, if we arbitrarily give the system um, the sepal length, width and petal width and length, it can use an algorithm to try to predict what it's likely to be. And we tend to use Iris because it's a it's an example that's been around for years and comes up with very simple, clear results. So it's a, it's a great bit of training data. The other bit, and I said this is the one that looked very complex, is the pipeline. So you can see in this diagram on the left hand side, we have the data that we've loaded in and then this estimator chain, the, the pipeline, 
goes through a set of steps. It drops columns. So we're doing some data wrangling saying we don't need these columns and the like. It performs normalization to get the data into a state that we're ready to work with. And we'll come back and talk about that uh, in our ROMCOM example. And then it applies a algorithm on this. The net result of this model file, this is the zip file that we're going to ultimately be exporting out. And that zip file, that model, contains the entire learnings of this pipeline and the data and represents, you know, the data needed to actually perform this analysis, all wrapped up in this nice, neat model. So, given our background in what ML.NET is, we covered some basics and, you know, it's, although it might perhaps be a bit daunting at first sight, the language and the API are not that difficult to get your head around. I would argue that in a day or so of playing, you'll have mastered the core bits and all the samples available you can use as your basis for learning. Let's get on to our example, rom-com or not rom-com. So last year, Phil and I were sitting around with a cup of coffee in the days when you could do that sort of thing and talking about fun projects. As Phil said, we like fun projects. They make this whole stuff um, a lot more interesting to tackle things like that. I'm a keen film fan and had been watching Mark Kermode's excellent BBC series, The Secrets of Cinema. If we're in a room, I'd ask if anyone would put their hand up who'd seen that. But, um, and in it, Mark goes through uh, five different genre types, which we replicate in our sample, rom-coms, horrors, comedy, heist, science fiction. And he decomposes the work directors do in creating each of these um, genres of movies. So in rom-com, the uh, meet cute bit where they meet for the first time, the breakup, the heartache, the get back together. He covers the different steps that are common in all the Hollywood movies and does excellent examples of, you know, we can see that for real. So I do urge you, if you're interested in that, um, go and watch those. And Phil and I were talking about this and we said, well, it's probably, you know, overly difficult for a machine learning sample. But the supposition uh, Phil made to me was, I wonder if we analysed a whole load of movie scripts, we could see some patterns in them that would give us an indication of what are the phrases and what are the sort of characterizations and stuff like that that are typical of a particular genre. So we thought, what the heck? Let's give it a go. So we spun up this open source uh, project um, on my GitHub account and we um, had a go. We've been playing around with this. We actually went back to the ML.NET team, engaged with them. They gave us some useful advice. This is listed on one of their sample sites to go and explore uh, language processing, everything like that. So let's look at what we did. And with a big hello to Jason Isaacs, let's explore how this sample works. Step one, go get yourself a pile of movie scripts. Now, um, Phil and I have not included any movie scripts in our GitHub repository because we fear that there's probably some copyright issues associated with this sort of thing. Fortunately, the internet is awash uh, with sites that have movie scripts and make them available for research, which I think this very much is. Good news is we don't need detailed stage directions, film producers notes, we just need the basic text, anything we can get. So we went out, searched around and picked up about a dozen of each of the genres and started playing with them. If you look on the left hand side, you can see some of the ones. Serendipity, Secrets of Seattle, Holiday, we've got Baby Driver, Ronin, Monty Python, Holy Grail, Zoolander, Space Odyssey, a lot of great films there. What you need to do with this project is go out, get them, put them all in a subdirectory and run our script processor. And the role of the script process is really, really simple. It's to chunk through all those scripts file by file and add them to a tab separated value file with two columns. The label one, remember in the previous thing, the label, that's the thing we're interested in. So we have to do some supervised learning work here and we have to name each of them. You can see a one for rom-com, two for horror. This is the Kovri buildup and all the movie as a single line 
with the extraneous sort of punctuation, all that sort of stuff removed. Now, in our first cut, Phil and I did use Azure Text Analytics to reduce the movie script down to just the key phrases. But actually, ML.NET has a really good uh, capability for that and part of its pipeline. So we actually got rid of that. So this first step is just simply a way of taking a bunch of movie scripts and creating a simple file that we can then actually do some processing. Stage two is to do the hard work. This is where it all happens here. We need to train a multi-classifier ML.NET model. So unlike binary classifier, which we talked about earlier with your um, sentiment analysis, is this good sentiment, is this bad sentiment? We actually need to take each of the five genres you can see here, build up a model and check it against each of those. So um, the model builder CSX file uh, is a script that does all that work. In a training mode with a command line parameter, it actually creates that zip file, the model there. And just for a bit of fun, you can pass on the command line a short sentence and just do a quick check to see how the model is doing. So we go, let's drive and spend Christmas in the city and party. You can see Phil's excellent graph at the bottom of the screen there. It clearly thinks with the highest probability of 0.82 that this is a rom-com. It's quite a high horrorness. Really, but David, there's a, um, a good point to make here. I was using .NET script when writing this uh, because I, I'm a bit of a glutton for punishment and most of the examples are not in .NET script. But what this shows is this was about an afternoon of playing around to, to make it work in that form. To work with most of the samples if you're using a console app or um, another app that you're more familiar with, it's really easy to get started. So you'll see, you'll see me using .NET script here because oh, I was seeing if it's possible. You don't have to, in your favorite kind of app that you're building, it works perfectly well. Indeed, and indeed, Phil, if we look at this next slide of the code, I've summarized this out just to make it really easy uh, for people to get a sense of what's happening under the cover. There's the three main stages here in the code. You can see how tight this code is. There's more comments than there are actual code. The, the, Top one is loading the data into the file. The bottom bit is running uh, the estimator pipeline on that data. The middle is where we build up that transform. And that the first one is interesting, that featureized text. T tell me a little bit more about that because that came out of our research, didn't it? it? It did. So first thing, yeah, I wrote comments. Go, go figure. Anyone who knows me will find this. As you know, I was quite, I was quite proud of making all of this work, so I commented it. Um, the featureized text line is actually a pretty magical command that they've built into ML.NET. As David said, we were looking uh, at the start in pre-processing that data in a lot of ways. Featureized text does uh, what you could consider best practice to turn that text into numbers that the algorithm can work on. It builds in a whole set of different capabilities. Each of those is available, um, whether it's you know, turning it into a bag of words or um, you know, word to vec or any of those kind of things into vectors, etc. And you can do each of those separately if you choose to. But featureized text essentially does everything you need for the majority of cases. So it's a massive productivity gain at that point. And there, there was an interesting question um, about training times. When we were training on the key phrases only, training was very fast, but the results weren't great. It's a good place to start, but it was a bit, you know, lots of things came up as horror as opposed to other things. Yeah, yeah. we did have that problem, didn't we? Everything seemed to be a horror. That's it. <laughs> yeah, it, everything, everything seemed to be a horror. After a bit more research and experiments, um, we found out that, first of all, we didn't need to do that pre-processing because featureized text removes the stop words for us and, um, you know, uh, lemmatizes and does all of those different bits and pieces that you need to do. And so we could put in the whole of our text straight away. This pushed up the training time. So I think we hit about five minutes for the, the best model that we could get here, which isn't a huge amount of time. And we started to get much better accuracy from that. So essentially leaning on the great work of the ML.net team saved us time. Yeah, so that, that featureized text and then playing around with the different algorithms, in this case, the SDCA 
um, my, my sort of entropy thing. Those two are where all the magic happens. The rest of it is just shuffling data and columns around. And that that's a great point, actually, that um, at the start, we didn't know which of the algorithms would be best. We just kind of used the SD, uh, used the, the the namespace and had a go with them to see what they did. And then afterwards, when we found the best one, we did the research to to make sure we knew what it was doing because, you know, as David said, this was <coughs> started over a coffee um, in an afternoon. So David has just stepped away from his camera, um, and so. What I'd recommend here is when you're first looking at ML.net, don't be scared and think you have to do lots of research up front. Get yourself to a position where you have an understood problem. In this case, we were looking at uh, David's favorite area of um, films, films and understanding films. Start getting to that pipeline that works. Work through the example, put your data in after you've tried one of the samples and then start to investigate the pieces. This is a great learning journey towards more advanced data science and machine learning as well. Um, and ML.NET gives you an easy pathway to do this from essentially a screen of code all the way to the full breakdown and details that you need. Welcome back, David. Thank you. We had great fun doing all of this. You know, it really was a big learning exercise. And once we got the basic model, we then said, well, how do we actually operationalize it? And we're keen to mention this because I think a lot of folk think that once you've got the model right, the hard work is done, you can step back and relax. It's actually, we still need to think about the other side of the um, iteration, which is what happens next once you've got a model. Nice thing about ML.net is the fact that we can use, you know, the mechanisms we're used to for exposing APIs, which is what we wanted to do. For this so i went and created a brand new mvc web app because that's you know a lot one of the most common ways people have over the years um you know exposed apis there's a lot of support in the tooling a lot of people know the mvc model i could have easily chosen an azure function as well that might be a, a better more modern approach to it but the goal was to show the things you used to just take them and run your code behind it and what you can see on the screen here is um postman making a post to the body of some text and at the bottom here you can see a json array for each of the uh, genre types with a probability and i've highlighted there that the rom-com is the highest probability with 0.52 and this is indeed uh, not held so um you know that's exactly right if you're going to do the MVC or the Azure function, it all boils down to the same basic capability in there. Here's the post for the API. We're using HTTP routing. Um, um, we check the validity of the model and the highlighted bit is where all the hard work takes. Again, we're building on the work that the ML.NET team have done, which is they create a prediction engine pool, which is a static type that they manage for that. We load up this model and we make a prediction based on the input. You can see here, we chose our script analysis model. We took the input that's been passed through it. We get the results back and the rest of that screen is just to enumerate through the results and prettify it up. So we have a nice array that we serialize to JSON and send back. Simple as that. Anyone who's ever done a functional web API we'll get this up and going in an hour or two and use all the things they're familiar with, like Lambda functions and all this. We then want to deploy it. Again, the work doesn't stop just we've got because we've got an API. We want to actually get it out there. And for us, that means Azure. So I went to one of our DevOps experts, Jason, and we said, Jason, how would you recommend you do this? And he said, well, we're making a lot of engineering effort around the deployment center, and these days it represents a really easy way to set up a deployment so that every time we do a check in into the GitHub repository, it will trigger off actions that will then rebuild the code and do a proper CI CD pipeline into Azure. So there's none of this. It works on my machine. Why doesn't it work up in the cloud? Phil and I automated the whole process with 
JSON's help, and we take our code and the model file and deploy it out there. Really simple, really straightforward. Um, and since we did our first bit of work on this, uh, the DevOps story has got even better with GitHub. So uh, one of the newest areas that we spent quite a bit of time talking about at Build last month was GitHub Actions, where you can build up the script necessary to describe all the steps needed to take um, a check-in into GitHub and output the relevant um, you know, assets that we're going to run there. So you can see in the top left corner, it shows they've got um, two actions, essentially one uh, around the UI and one around the back end. And by simply saying it's a web app, the stuff on the right hand side, the publish updated API dot YAML, that code was auto generated. That YAML I didn't write myself. That's always put me off, I think, and a lot of other developers is trying to do this stuff by hand. It's it did all the work back now if necessary go in and tweak and tune that if I want to change it. So it makes this whole GitHub actions really easy. So there's now kind of no excuse not to have a problem of a CI CD pipeline when you're working on projects. And finally, this is it. Um, we also got Jason to do us a lovely UI. Thank you, Jason. Works really uh, nicely. And this is the bit where you actually get to try it at home there. So if if you've got a browser open, why don't you spin up, go to aka.ms slash romcom and try this out for yourself. Um, it's some samples will give a couple of moments. Um, the very time it first time it gets hit, it can often take 20 seconds or so because we've we've been cheap skates. We're running this on the free uh, tier. Um, but if you want to try that in the background and uh, feed in some text and see what happens, it does it interactively every half second or so. It makes that API call and takes the text and gives you this nice little chart. So on the left hand side, I put in a bit from my best friend's wedding and it clearly comes out as a, a rom com. And the Lost Boys on the right hand side comes with horror with a bit of rom com in there. It is quite humorous again. These are examples that are not in our training database that they've never seen before. So uh, if anyone gets any interesting results, uh, please post them into the chat area. So for the final bit of this session, I'm going to cover two of the more advanced capabilities in there just to round off uh, our little tour of ML.net. So as Phil alluded to earlier, we spent quite a bit of time tweaking and tuning the right algorithms uh, to do the text processing before we found the right solution. And this is not an uncommon situation. You can spend a lot of time doing this um, work here. So AutoML is a way of automating this process because for every data set, uh, the right, the, the, uh, the optimal, should we say, pipeline will vary and choosing the right pipeline and the uh, algorithms in there. And each of these algorithms have what they call hyperparameters that need to be tuned. It's kind of tough and this chart on the right shows how people produce these wonderful things designed to give you a little cheat sheet as to how to proceed. Um, AutoML does the heavy lifting for us and I'll show that. Uh, the actual um, sample here, we can let it do the hard work, try lots and lots of different um, options and then come back and report port the best one to us rather than us do it by hand. The, the ML.CLI is the only way of at the moment really of getting at that auto ML and it's command line base. You can see here MLNet auto train. Uh, the moment we currently support three classifications, binary, multi-class and regression. You feed in the data set, provide any of the other parameters, off it goes and produces that zip file along with some boilerplate templated code to run it. Um, uh, it's an active development ML.net so you can expect to see recommendations, anomaly detections, ranking and clustering also coming out from that team. Now Phil and I have had lots of discussions about this whole thing. What is the best model? Um, it's, it's quite a tough one in, in many senses. 
But one of the things is when you run AutoML, such as the binary classifier example here, it will throw out various metrics to help you better understand it. So we have things like accuracy and recall and area under the curve. Um, the nice thing is the ML.NET documentation gives you links to help you better understand what these uh, mean and what's acceptable and what's not. So you can see here uh, the STCA logistic regression binary algorithm is the one that's come out with the best score and that's what it's recommending. So it's kind of nice that it exposes its outcomes in case you, I guess, want to do um, tune them yourself or overrule them if there was something you knew about the data. The other one, and I think this is kind of cool, is the ML.NET model builder. It used to be uh, an add-in for Visual Studio. It now ships with the 16.6 .6 release, which just came out, I think, a week or two ago. And it's a very easy way to run some of these models from scratch and have a wizard guide you through both the training process and the creating of the code to consume it. And you literally in the bottom left corner, you right click on your project, click add machine learning, and it takes you through this wizard on the right hand side. Um, when this first came out, you could only run locally on your machine, but uh, one of the new features that's in preview, which I'll mention, is for image classification, you can actually push this workload out to Azure to do its heavy lifting and then bring the results back in. So what does the process look like? I'll step you through on the slides here. So the scenario, we've gone for image classification to really show that um, Azure capability is an option. You then select your training environment, uh, either locally on my machine. I've got a Surface Laptop 3, really nice beefy machine, um, and it was able to churn through this. So I did one run on that. And then one of the new features, I set up a, an Azure machine learning workspace to do uh, this work. Really easy to do from the UI in Visual Studio. And under the cover, you can see the bottom right here, we get an NC series. So that's one of the NVIDIA. Um, GPU cards and we push the results up there, it does the work and then we get those back. So this means the limitations of having a machine that could be sitting there for hours suddenly means that we can just give it to Azure and off it goes. We then, keeping in line with our dogs and cats theme throughout this session, um, you point at the data. One of the nice things it does is it uses the folder as metadata. So you can see here, I've got a folder and there's a cat's folder and a dog's folder and it takes the name of the folder as the metadata, making it very easy. So I went out onto the internet and got a load of pictures of dogs. I then clicked the train button, firstly on my local machine, so you can hear, um, see that the Visual Studio goes through all the stuff, tells you algorithm by algorithm all things to try and all the results, and then at the end goes, Ta da This is the one I've chosen for you. If you go with Azure Machine Learning, you can actually follow this in real time up on Azure. And here you get a proper bit. This is the proper uh, machine learning workspace area where you can track your experiments and the results and go back to time and try things out. So it's, it's a much more sophisticated setup. It's where I think the real data scientists would spend their time. So you can see here, ML.NET is helping you bridge this world by seeing the experiments and how they're being run. And then at the end, brings the results back down to you into your code. You can then evaluate it. So this is this is our dog. This is Honey, a very cute little cockapoo. And I've deliberately picked pictures where Honey is either amongst bluebells or in snow. So it's not kind of totally clear. You can see a whole body and it's pretty good at um, even on a what is a relatively small um, data set, being quite confident, nearly 90 percent the first one and 99% that honey is a dog rather than a cat. So, you know, that's a good way of testing the results. And then the final stage of this is it actually generates the code into your project to get you up and going. And now you can consume that model in your app. So, you know, nice touch. So that's really our whistle stop tour of ML.NET with a dive into uh, language processing. In terms of the roadmap, 
you can see here that team is still very active lots of things they're working on again it's all open source so you know you can go in look at the stuff make requests get involved in the process for example uh, the uh, GPU training um, you know there's still work to be done there there's you know hooking in with the devil a lot of really interesting stuff there which is I think if you're investing time and effort it's good to know that there's an active um, engineering team working on those capabilities because this is a um, whistle stop tour I've tried to include more for uh, the links uh, afterwards some things that will help you get up and going the samples the docs and all of this and I think we will finish off by putting this slide up that Emma said about um, please give us some feedback on the session it's very important for the reactor and their team to uh, get that feedback and within a few days this video should be up and going so Phil anything I've forgotten to mention any questions that have come up that we've not been able to uh, answer so um i've been handling the questions uh while you've been speaking so lots of links shared there and also the the links at the end that you had were great please do fill in the survey uh, we really value your feedback and making sure that we get the kind of content that that you want um some of the questions have been uh, fantastic and i've done my best to, to link to the answers but i really would say that Go and have a play. It's all available to you there. If this is some an area you want to get learning in, there's uh, really no barriers to get started. Visual Studio Code, uh, .NET Core, off you go. Great fun. Cool. Well, thank you, Phil. Thank you for setting this up. Thanks everyone for their time. We've come in a couple of minutes, and uh, so please use that time to fill in the survey. Otherwise, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, everyone.